What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Bikes and Beer. You guys seem to really enjoy the first one, so I figured we would do it again, make it a theme here on the channel. We are out at the original spot that I wanted to do the first video at, and I don't think there's gonna be anybody here today, so let's see what we can get into. I tell you what, Ohio flipped a switch and we are seeing lows in the 40s now. So fall is here, summer is gone. And I gotta pay attention here because this is a gnarly little section. <laughs> I butchered that. Oh my. Still on the IRCs. Still on them. We gotta change that very soon. I think I say in every 300 video that we're gonna change it soon, but I haven't got around to doing it. Obviously, still out here struggling. But the leaves are still on the trees, so we've got a few more weeks of good weather. A lot of people love fall, and I do, but it just doesn't last long. Then we got to deal with those cold temperatures and that white stuff. And I forgot, we got a lot of rain, so the river's going to be high. <laughs> you can see the path from where my three-wheeler beats it down. I actually crashed in this spot before. Whew. But we got a couple new beers to try, so I'm excited about that. During that three-wheeler camping video, our fire was actually over there, which is now submerged. Not really sure where I want to set this up, but we'll figure it out. What's going on everybody? Welcome to another episode of Bikes and Beer. This time we're a little bit more set up and as you can see we've got a real chair. And I'm sure I'll get some questions. So this is from a company called Click. This chair is unbelievable. I've been super happy with it. It folds down into the size of a thermos. The size alone makes it great for dual sporting and pretty much anything for that matter because it's a really comfortable chair. The way it's designed, it almost feels like a hammock, the way it cradles your body. You can set it up in about 10 seconds. And if you buy a two pack, it even comes with its own carrying case. So I'll leave a link down in the description. Super awesome product, but let's get on with the video. Today, we're gonna be continuing the theme, polishing off the BrewDog pack and sipping on some Elvis juice straight from Elvis's udders. This is a grapefruit infused IPA. I'm a sucker for some of the fruity beers. I know a lot of people out there don't like them, but I do. Has to be a balance though. If it's too sweet, it tastes a little nasty, but when they get it just right and have just a little hint of fruit, it can make all the difference. Live fast, drink slow. I like that. Let's see if we can get that crack on audio. Oh yeah. Ooh, that's good. I'm a fan of that. Ooh, just like I said, a little hint is all it takes, and this is perfect. I sound like a beer snob now, but I am very much novice. I'm really just getting into the craft beers for the sake of the channel. And speaking of that, if you have a beer that you would like me to try, drop it down in the comment section below. I think I only had one recommendation in the last video. But man, this has grown to be one of my favorite spots in the area. Apart from a few local kids and the spontaneous fishermen, I usually have it all to myself. It's just a nice quiet place that you can come here and unwind, listen to the water flowing by. I definitely wouldn't eat anything out of this river. Unfortunately, a lot of rivers in Ohio are just absolutely filthy. People just don't care around here. There's trash everywhere. Not only that, but all the farmland, all the fertilizer and stuff just leaches into our river systems and just makes everything disgusting. But based on the title of this video, I'm sure not a lot of you are here to talk about fish. So we will get right into it. Guys, let's talk about the DRZ 400. Got to drink some more before we get into this. Let me start off by saying the DRZ 400 is a fantastic machine. There's a reason why it is still around the day. It stood the test of time. Man, it's been 20 plus years. It's had an amazing run, but damn it, is it time for an upgrade. Suzuki is holding on by a thread. I don't know who wakes up in the morning and says, today I'm gonna go buy a Suzuki because it's not me, it's not any of my friends. They're just at the bottom of the barrel of innovation these days. They're not doing anything special. Apart from the DRZ 400, 
100, the Versus, some of the Jixers, I guess, they are striking out. And I'm more into the off-road scene, so they might have some good bikes outside of that. But for the most part, everything that they offer is just super outdated. But the DRZ 400 is a bike that I've owned personally. It is a 400cc thumper, five speeds. It is known as a tank in the dual sport world. I actually had the 400 SM, so it had the supermoto wheels. They are a blast on the street. And there's a lot of good things about the DRZ. But with manufacturers like Honda and Kawasaki stepping up their game, we now have dual sports like the CRF 300L, the KLX 300, that really are just leaving the DRZ in the dust. And there are still a lot of people out there that prefer the older technology compared to these newer bikes, but that's not me. Even after owning my 250L, I would probably never buy one again. But for the most part, I am a four seasons rider. Hell, I've even took the 250L out in the snow. I've been out to different elevations. And that is one thing about these newer bikes that I absolutely love, and that is the fuel injection. They are set up to ride literally anywhere. They will automatically adjust to elevation and temperatures. It's 2021, we're going into 2022. I do not miss carburetors. And you'll have the group of old heads that say, oh, but they're easier to work on. They're more reliable. How are you gonna fix it in the field? Let me just tell you, I beat the shit out of my 250L and I've never had an issue. I'm sure there's some very, very small isolated cases, but for the most part, I would say that fuel injection is more reliable. On all of my fuel injected bikes, I've never had to clean the fuel system, even when I've let things sit. Versus a carburetor, unless you're running ethanol free, it's gonna gum up if you let it sit for an extended period of time. And I've had countless carburetors cracked open, cleaning out the jets, and it's just not something that I enjoy dealing with. Having to pull the choke, warm things up, and ultimately just have a worse performance in those conditions. There's a reason why fuel injection exists, and that is why I love these bikes so much more. They are so user friendly. Just keep oil oil in it, hop on it, and go. Four seasons, doesn't matter the temperature, the elevation, it's gonna fire up and it's gonna perform. And that's what makes these bikes so special to me. The fact that you're still able to ride it like a dirt bike, but you don't have to do all the dirt bike maintenance. And that's not referring to the DRZ 400 because those bikes don't need a lot. They are absolute tanks. This is just a personal opinion. And we'll talk about some of the key differences that in my mind makes these bikes superior. So fuel injection, we talked about that. Next, the five-speed transmission on the DRZ. It just doesn't cut it after you've rode a six-speed wide ratio. You're always searching for that sixth gear and I promise you it does not exist. The DRZ does okay on the road. I had my SM on the highway numerous times and it can be done. You're gonna be higher up in the rev range in that fifth gear, so there's gonna be a lot more vibrations and overall it's just gonna be less comfortable and it's just outdated technology. Just look at KTM, Husqvarna. They're offering their six speed wide ratio in their dirt bikes. So the five speed is just aggravating once you've rode a different bike. To be completely honest, I could probably live with two of those things, but there's one thing that I cannot live with, and that is the weight of the DRZ. If you compare it to other bikes, it's really not bad. But for me, the DRZ has just always felt heavy and in the wrong ways. Like, I don't know if it's the position of the tank, the fact that the oil's up high in the frame, but it just feels really top heavy. Now, a bike that I have not rode is the DRZ 400E, and that is the more dirt-oriented option. I would like to have a go on that bike someday, but I'm really focusing on the 400S and 400SM. But even compared to a bike like the 250L and the 300L, the weight difference is just night and day to me. So if you do own a DRZ and you've also rode one of these bikes, let me know your thoughts down below. I just feel like it wears it in the wrong ways. The bike's got a muffin top. It's got a big rack with no ass. We can't be having that. There's ways around that. It's 2021, get the shots. So lack of fuel injection, the five-speed transmission, the weight. What else don't I like about the DRZ? The price. Now, if you were to go out and buy one brand new, you're looking at around $7,000 for a bike that has 1980s technology. That is just absolutely insane to me. And that's the thing, is people still buy them. That's why they still exist. 
Now, a lot of people prefer to buy new things. I'm not one of those people, especially a bike like the DRZ that's been around for so long, is tried and true. For the most part, if you buy one that runs and doesn't smoke, it's gonna be all right. I guess that's a counter argument to the price is there's far more used DRZs out there than there are 250Ls and the 300L. I mean, this is still a brand new bike and why I bought it brand new is because I couldn't find a used one. But that $7,000 MSRP is just atrocious. And like many other people my age these days, I'm offended. That price offends me. I didn't pay that much for my brand new 300L with fuel injection, six speeds. It's just crazy to me. And the only thing that they're allowed to do is change the color of the plastics and offer bold new graphics. It's a joke, but I really can't fault them for that because they can't change anything without completely redesigning the bike because of emissions standards. But hey, Honda now has the 450L. So Suzuki, I really hope that they're doing something. If not, they will probably go out of business. It really just amazes me why they've just let themselves get so far behind in the market but hopefully they have something underneath their sleeves i doubt it but it's just really crazy to think of their bike lineup and just how ancient everything is but even with the used market the drz holds its value i've only found a few good deals on drz's they all seem to hover around the four or five thousand dollar mark even for some of the older ones but like i said they just have a cult following a lot of people still ride them but i'm here today to stop that just stop riding the drz dork in the road this one's for you he actually went from the 250l to the drz so You'll have to talk to him about that. I never understood it. Maybe it's because he's a little bit bigger. He likes to haul more gear. So that little bit of extra power was more benefit to him. I don't know. To each his own. Like I said, this is all my opinion. Everybody's got their own opinion. But yeah, what else can we bash about the DRZ? It's kind of irrelevant, but the appearance of the DRZ, I don't think it's a bad looking bike. It's definitely outdated, of course. You still got that square glass headlight, the square front fender, at least with the S models. They definitely rule the supermoto market though, and hats off to them for making a lot of money over the years. I'm glad to see that Kawasaki finally offers an SM. Honda, where you at? I know they had the 250M. That was a good option. A lot of people enjoyed those, but we never got that here in the States. Not sure why, because it would sell. There's a lot of sumo bros out there. It would save you the hassle of having to go out and spend $1,000 on some Warp 9s and have some poor bastard like Cycle Cruiser trying to spoon them. The tip broke off. I can't get it, man. God Cycle Cruiser, hit me up. I'm trying to ride. I won't expose you. I won't harm you. I'm just a longtime fan that would like to do a little slide action with you. Uh, man, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna have to put my jacket on. It's getting a little chilly when the sun goes down. Uh, uh, uh. But really my main purpose of making this video is I know a lot of people are out there trying to get into the sport. I'm always getting questions about which bike should I buy. And a lot of people want me to compare the DRZ 400 to the 300L. And that's really hard to do because there's a night and day difference. The DRZ has way better suspension from the factory, more adjustability. I'd also argue that it's more durable, but overall as a whole, I would way rather spend my time on a bike like the 300L than an outdated DRZ. At least for street riding, I've really like the smoothness that the fuel injected bikes give you not only with the temperature and elevation differences it's just amazing to have especially when you're relying on the bike to get you home it's a little bit different if you're just out riding dirt bikes but on a dual sport you're out on longer adventures some people use these as their main transportation and if that was the case i would be on a 300l they perform incredibly well on the street they do fine off-road, they get really good fuel economy, and for the most part, they're pretty damn solid. So that's my take on the DRZ400 versus the CRF300L. If you're an old school guy or girl and you just love carburetors and that glorious five-speed transmission, then sure, the DRZ might be for you. But I do like modern technology. There's a lot of benefits to it. So a bike like the 300L appeals to me way more than the DRZ. But I hope you enjoyed my DRZ rant. I think we're gonna branch off from that unless I think of anything else to mention. I'd highly suggest you ride something first before you buy it. Get on some forums, get in some Facebook groups. You can probably find somebody local that has either bike you're looking to ride. And there are a lot of nice people out there that will let you ride their bikes. Just be careful with the fork seals.
But as always, we have a lot of exciting stuff coming to the channel. So if you are new, please consider subscribing. Hit those notifications if you haven't already. Drop a like if you enjoy this format. You guys seem to really enjoy the Bikes and Beer series. I wish I had more things to say about the beer, but I really don't. It's a good beer. I would definitely drink it again. They did a good job with the Elvis juice. It's my perfect definition of a fruity beer. Just a hint. That's all you need. Driven by passion and united by brew dog. Damn, that's deep. And I just noticed that it's supposed to look like a flag. I'm a little slow. I think, uh, oh crap, it is probably seven o'clock or it's 6.52. So we're actually gonna go live here in a bit. And I'm sure a lot of people are gonna be bummed out that we're not doing the dash tonight. But if you made it this far, thank you for watching. I'm gonna get some drone shots before the sun goes down and we're gonna go live here in a bit. 